Welcome back, Joe. Good to be back in the in the gallery space. Um, we've had some really good positive feedback from the last video that we did here, which was which was nice. So it's uh, um, we wanted to come back and discuss some more of the themes and give some more insights. But what I think what people are looking for and what I quite like to do is just get into the mind of the photographer, you know, discuss in more detail what we're thinking, our inspirations, insights, past influences, etc. So a bit more of what we we did before. Um, Aya, you all right? Hello, yes. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry, you're filming. Yes. Take two. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we just dive a little bit deeper? Does that sound good? Yeah, no, that's perfect. I, I think that uh, one of the things that we've discovered through doing this process is the creative process is both out in the field, it's in post-production, it's in conversations with friends, it's in curating, isn't it? And, mm. and actually, I think, for me, one of the most exciting things about doing the show is the opportunity to explore the whole kind of artistic um, side of, of photography in more depth than one would normally get the chance to do. So hopefully the video will give a bit of insight into that. So we'll start with Gifts of Light and just with the one of the large prints behind me here. Smashing. Good. So we're looking here at one of my uh, images from a, a local woodland, obviously, um, called Anticipation. So shall I go in and sort of give you my, what yeah, I was on, thinking? Yeah. <laughs> and then you can tell, give me your interpretation, which is always fascinating to hear. I guess going into reason why it's called Anticipation to start with, it is the anticipation of what lies beyond. Because we're not, I think sometimes we're not heading towards a horizon as such, are we? We're just always trying to sort of just find our way. And that's what I tried to sort of, it's trying to capture that experience of the woods within the image um, is a very difficult thing. But one, one way that I like to do it is so that there is like a very obvious route for the eye to follow um, because that's like saying, well, this is where I'm going to go next. Um, and I can't wait to see what I find <laughs> because you, never, you can never see very far ahead. And you just, you know, what's around the next corner, what's beyond those trees that you see in the distance. And that anticipation is what excites me the most. And it's why I'm, I like to find um, the, the process of finding a new wood. And it doesn't matter what the conditions are, but stepping into that place for the first time, I get incredibly excited. And it's actually a quote that I used in my book, which I think it's something along the lines of the charm of a woodland road is not just in its beauty, but in its anticipation. And societal. Yeah, hence the title. Hence the title. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to jump in there because I, I, okay. you know, because it was several things that you you touched on. It just made me think that uh, what, what the way you described it was. I, I was thinking this is a metaphor for life, actually. Mm. You know, the 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 you know the the anticipation of what's ahead, that, and that there are there are a number of different paths that you can take in life. Mm. Um, and it's for you to, to choose them. And actually, if you, if you look at this picture, that you could argue there are kind of three distinct ways. Yes. Um, what, you know, that, that, that's, that's a nice thing, as one that falls off on the right-hand side here. There's this lovely kind of central area here um, with this beautifully sunlit oak uh, right in the middle mm -hmm. of the image. And, and then on the left-hand side, where the sun is penetrating the wood, it is dissolving in light, to use the John Blakemore phrase, um, which which is where it fits so well with uh, with this theme. And I should say that what I think is really magical about this picture is that the trees in the front, including the holly here, is incredibly tactile. And you can reach out and touch them, and yet as you recede, as we recede in space through the image. Uh, well, the softness and the mystery of it are what make it in relation to that uh, that wonderful tactile contrast of the trees. So it both has physical presence, the reality of the scene, but also the the, the sense of un, the unknown yeah. that lies beyond. And I think it's that combination of elements that makes it so strong. Yeah, thank you, thank you. But I think it's important that we don't, when we are presented with such wonderful conditions that we don't lose sight of what we're trying to ch achieve compositionally as well uh, which is easy to do that i've done that in the past where we've had brilliant light i'm just photographing the light and then compositionally it just uh, it loses something in translation and um, so going back to the day when i actually made this image the the day before this 
um, I met you in this wood and I came up the hill and it, I was amazed to see some, some fog there because from the outside of the wood it looked clear. But it didn't last very long. I think I made one or two, one or two images and then as, as it dissipated, I started to scout the, scout the area. And this is a composition that I came up with just under very, very flat light. I could see some potential there. Very rarely do we use holly in woodland photographs, but it made quite a nice little um, anchor point there. This lit tree in the background, that was quite obvious under the flat light as well, just having that vanishing point right in the center of the composition. This little squiggly character here, uh, nice separation between the, the different trees in the scene. So I spent a lot of time doing that, trying to see potential, getting excited by that and just trying to nail the composition under more sort of generic conditions. Went back the next day, I was just presented with, with this, which was just wonderful. To get that combination of mist and light is actually quite rare for us. Rather than getting too carried away and running around and losing focus because of the conditions, just uh, separate the comp composition and actually just take that moment then to Yes, there is a technical process of executing it, but it just allowed me just to step back from the camera and just enjoy that moment to observe it and try to remember it and the experience, remember that as well as, as, well as capture it. Um, and it just highlights how important, not for everyone, but certainly I feel from in woodland photography, how important the process of scouting is and building up that intimate knowledge and having, having preconceived ideas really does um, benefit sometimes. Yeah, it's a, that's that's really true, and I, I think it, it, what we're really talking about here is not just the gift of light, but the gift of time. Yes. If you're lucky enough to have the time to have that uh, to, to to repeat, to go out again and again and again, then so long as you retain that creative spirit all the time, you you are more secure in what you're going to see. So when the light is especially magical as this was. You're, you're, you're not racing or chasing or anxious, but you have that, that confidence and calm. Uh, it, it's so often the case that when, when conditions are really incredible, uh, having led a number of workshops, I know that those are usually the worst uh, for, for photographic results because yeah. every, everybody's yeah. rushing around trying to photograph everything yes. rather than keeping calm. And, may, and as, as you made the original point, composition is still fundamental. Just because the light's wonderful, that in itself is not enough. You do, you do need to be able to, uh, to focus on combining all these elements in the best possible way, which you have here. Thank you. Okay, shall we have a look at one of your images? Uh, yeah. yeah. Good, good. Right over my shoulder here. Okay, Requiem for Ash, um, beautiful image which I picked out for the front cover of the book, Woodland Sanctuary. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it did work incredibly well. And, and in terms of gifts of light, um, the gifts don't come much more generous than that. So do you want to tell us a bit? I'm not entirely sure where this was taken eh, either. So, um, I mean, don't reveal the location, but, <laughs> but yeah, if you want to tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually, it's, it's right off the track of a walk that I've done hundreds of times with, with my dog and, uh, and with Jenny, my partner. And uh, so I, I know those trees really, really well. Uh, and, and because it's underneath uh, a, a steep slope on the edge of the moor, uh, there's a dark, there's a dark background, relatively dark. Um, so it's always had that, has that potential uh, to make a, a nice image in the right lighting conditions. One of the things I should say is I, I remember reading a Galen Roll book years and years ago uh, and where he described, he, one of his chapters is called Artist's Light and it isn't all about projected light pictures but uh, all the pictures are about um, light as a, as a kind of source of inspiration. And ever since then I've had this idea of one day I would love I would love to make a picture of, of where light itself is just almost completely the subject mm -hmm. and probably this picture comes closest to that so the reason for that is that the trees themselves though they play a fundamental role in the image it's the fact that the light the light becomes almost more physical than the trees yes. um, in the image because they're projected rays and um, and the rays themselves, are, yeah, it's kind of got that slightly 
uh, Renaissance religious painting kind of look to yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, 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 it's very celestial. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, the title, by the way, uh, is uh, also has a, a little bit of requiem. We, we think it's a, it's a Latin word meaning rest. Um, that anybody's interested in trees and, and wood is conscious of the fact that ash trees are suffering from dieback, um, mm-hmm. globe, well, especially in Europe um, and in the UK currently. Um, so we're going to lose many, many ash trees, which is very sad. Mm-hmm. Whether we lose all of them, I don't know. Um, these are indeed ash, um, a stand of ash trees. The, there's, there's a beauty uh, and a poignancy um, and a sadness as well as a joy in the, in the beauty of the light. So in, I think, two minutes of photography, I saw it ha- starting to happen, yeah. managed to get my camera up. It was uh, the phase one on the Linhof, uh, so big camera. Uh, longest lens I had and uh, I think I got five exposures before it literally just evaporated mm-hmm. and there was you know, five completely different results yeah. so it's amazing it was literally just flowing changing in in those two minutes of photography. It's very very tempting with images like this I think because the light is so strong um, and such a key part of the image that there would be a tendency to go quite high contrast with this to make that light stand out even more mm-hmm. and get that definition between the light and the tree trunks. Um, but the fact that you've gone from a gentle approach, I think works really, really well. And it gives it that, you know, not it has impact, but has the softness to make it more inviting, more calming. Um, Everything's beautifully spaced, as I would expect from, from your work. Nice little avenues for the, the eye to go down. Um, but even though it's got that sort of softness to the light, there's a lovely contrasting sort of structural sharpness in the branches as well, which just gives that kind of intricate detail uh, in contrast to that softness. And you can actually tell, I, I can sort of see by looking at this, that it's one of those mornings where there's probably very little mist and it just, it looks very damp down there. It's just one of those moments where you know you're either there to make it happen um, in those few split seconds, or you're not. When making images like this, have you found that all the time that you've spent being very slow and deliberate with your choices when composing and, and crafting images, that when you are presented with very fleeting moments, that you're able to more, work more instinctively and quickly, and 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 still get very good results? <laughs> I'd like to think so. <laughs> but anyway, that's very nicely put. Yeah, because it, yeah. we're always to, often told to, sl- to to slow down, but there are moments where we have to work quickly, otherwise we don't get yeah. the image. Uh, absolutely, you have to be decisive. Yeah. And it is, uh, it, 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 after all, photography is an opportunistic art in lots of ways, yeah. uh, and being, being ready, um, and, and also sort of having, at least in the back of your mind, ideas about, uh, about how pictures work all the time. Uh, for example, it, 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 I could have gone wider uh, with this picture, but I, I, I instinctively knew that a condensed, um, simplified, for me, certainly simplified structure would, would make a, a better image. And, and that meant changing lenses, which with those, with those cameras isn't easy, so it does, is time consuming. So you have to be making those calculations, literally, as you're yeah. walking towards the scene, yes. thinking, Am I, can I get to where I need to be, given the perspective I would like to have, um, with, and, and actually have a reasonable idea of how the focal lengths will map out in your mind. Yes. Yes, it's not zooms, it's all prime lenses, prime lenses which have to be opened up manually, um, focused, wide open, stopped down to the, uh, a, a reasonable taking aperture. All those things have to be done. You kind of calculating in your mind, which is where the instinct comes in, mm-hmm. That, that, that you'll be able to do what needs to be done in the time that's available to you. So, yeah, I think that that's, that's true. Um, there is a feeling of kind of spontaneity to it, um, and, but that kind of instinctive quality, which I think is what often gives images a bit of soul, um, where some of the decisions that you've made, you weren't aware of, aware of every single one, but there's something in there in your subconscious that um, has allowed you to kind of craft the image and get everything where it needs to be. Um, because otherwise things can look quite clinical, can't they? So in terms of instinct, then how, how, what do you think is a good way to nurture that in photography? 
I, I think practice. That's the only uh, only way I can put it, really. Um, I think you have to learn to trust yourself, though. Yes. Um, I think, I'm, without wishing to get too autobiographical, I think when I started off in my photography, I had n no one was leading me anywhere um, because I, I was I was completely on my own. I didn't know any photographers. I didn't. I just found that I loved the camera. I mean, I literally fell in love with using the camera. Um, so everything I did was very. Um, I ju just photographed anything and everything that appealed to my eye as I looked through the viewfinder. Mm -hmm. And and in some ways I've never changed. So I think I've been lucky in that respect. I've never learned the rules or yeah. uh, I just worked it all out for myself. Yeah. Um, so that's that's in some ways been quite fortunate. Yeah, yeah. Trust your gut. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Good. Right. Gifts of that was gifts of light. Shall we have a look at? Um, well, I don't know if the room's locked at the <laughs> looking at the door, but shall we get into try and get into the sanctuary room? That'd be, That'd good. be good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're next to uh, the biggest print in the in the exhibition. Lucky me, lucky me. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, this is the sanctuary room. Um, so really, it, you know, it's it named after the what came first, the title of the exhibition or the title of the theme? Yeah, I think the exhibition. Right. Okay. First, yeah. 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 So it's it's a, yeah it's, it's probably my favourite theme in a lot of ways um, in the exhibition. Do you want to give us a quick introduction to it? Yeah. Why not? I, I think when you think of the uh, the original concept for the entire show is around uh, really woodland as, as a sanctuary, as a place of refuge, of, of safety, of um, a kind of spiritual home too. So it, it can work on all sorts of levels. And it represents the, the, the kind of uh, fulfillment really of, of the rest of the exhibition, so, or the journey. Um, so you come, you come home in a way to sanctuary. Um, as this the kind of resting place for us. Yeah. Um, and so probably there are going to be a few of our favourite pictures in here, I suspect. Yeah, I mean, because with some of the scenes, you know, they're quite evocative. You know, we have dark matter and mm. things that are visually a bit more kind of... Com yeah. Mm. Um, and then as you go through the space, it starts to become more positive and then becomes a very sort of restful space in here. Even just for a short while, you know, the world just sort of seems to make sense when, when in the woods. Um, and that's what's so magical about these spaces, I think. And that's certainly what I felt with this, uh, which is titled Lothlorien, named after the magical realm in Middle Earth. <laughs> um, you know, taking a lot of inspiration from, from films um, and these enchanted worlds which are created by, you know, these fabulous minds such as Tolkien. And the thing that I really try, what I love to capture is going back to what we were saying before about being immersed in the woods. And I think you can really get a sense of that when you take these broader panoramic scenes, but they're actually really a challenge to make, aren't they? Because we're wanting to take in a lot more, but to bring in a lot more, and that's still to make sense and tie together, which I think kind of creates, you know, it's a meander for the eyes. Um, I think you could, this is actually a four image stitch but you could almost treat it as individual images. You know, there's, there's the strength to that. Um, there's interest in this snap branch here. That's an image in itself. And that's usually what I'm aiming for with these panoramics is to almost get individual standalone images, to piece them together, to give it that kind of cohesion so that you can spend time with it. You know, that's what we do. We, we try to sort of stand, observe, mm -hmm. spend time with the scene. Um, and that's what I tried to achieve here, gradually appreciate different elements, but ultimately <coughs> that's the vanishing point and that's the route that you're going to then continue the journey, if you like. From a technical point of view, at the time it was, it was more of a kind of scouting mission. And I think I was using a 24 to 105 lens when I first made the panorama here. And I loved it so much that I went back the next day with just a 55 mil prime to try and get as much optical quality out of it as possible. Extremely lucky to get exactly the same conditions again. Um, and then, yeah, just casually repeated the same image, but with the, with the prime lens. Oh, that's such a photographer's story. It really, really is. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, because yeah, I, I, I could totally share that, the feeling of wanting to do the very, very, very best you can and feeling that maybe 
you know, if you didn't use your very, very best lens, then it's always a risk. Um, I mean, one thing I wanted to say, though, uh, about this image is, is that you mentioned the fact that there are individual vignettes or images within it, and that's true. But the reason it works so well is because it is more than the sum of the parts. And actually, the, the hard part of making any panorama is to achieve that, um, where, whereby the, you, know, the, you can stand well back from it, and it's totally coherent. Um, and it works with rhythm and shape and relationship. But as you approach it, you find yourself in these, you know, going down these little avenues of, of into details and, um, and journeys for the eye as you describe them. Um, and that, that's where this is really, really successful. It's not the fact that it's really sharp, which it is, but it is <laughs> yeah. the fact that yeah. visually it's really coherent. And, yeah. And that's not an easy task. I mean, I find it incredibly difficult to shoot panoramas. I've shot a lot of panoramas over the years, but um, most of them fail because they are not more than the sum of the parts. And that's the key, I think. So, yeah, congratulations on this. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's the understory is just fabulous. And it's that time of transition. And I love those moments in nature when you're transitioning from one season to another, mm. because I think some people have seen this and thought it's early autumn, it's actually mid-August when this was made and I'm sure if we go there now it would be looking quite quite similar to this. And then we've you know just offering these bits of frame as well with the, the oak canopy here, balanced with the oak canopy there. I think it's, it's it actually, sorry, aesthetically I think that, that that's really really important. It's so subtle though, you, you know, unless you pointed it out, everything just looks just right but, but so often it, it's, it's, you're holding the corners you know, here, exactly, yeah. uh, and, and so there is this sort of sense of, of the light bleeding through uh, from the background because it's a, that beautiful misty conditions, not, not the kind of magical mist with sunlight coming through it, but just ambient mist. But there's, again, the, the reason it works so well as it does is that typically it's very cool, which it is, and then, because there's this wonderful counterpoint from the bracken, the turning bracken, which is very warm. Yes, yeah, and, and well, it, it's it's, making sure that every element in the scene has a part to play and I felt that the detail and the texture and the colour and the darkness of the understory was was crucial to the image as well and it gives a nice sort of consistent foundation but the way this hill just falls away allows that feeling of very sort of strong light and the ethereal quality of the fog just to really give that contrast to where everything does become a lot darker because you very quickly hit the canopy this may have been uh, covered before, but, but let's again remind ourselves of how incredibly helpful it is having fog or mist, uh, which, which d softens all of the bright tones in the background so that the white sky um, isn't a problem because it, it, it just gently moves in, into the picture space. Uh, it, it's the, everything's connected through the softness. Uh, whereas if it was hard contrasts, it would be just too much and it would just be terribly distracting and, yeah. and not beautiful. So in terms of, of both the aesthetic of it, but also the, the, the kind of what you might call the metaphorical symbolic meaning of it, it works together as purely light. In fact, you're in, in shadow, in, in relative darkness, looking towards the light. I think mm -hmm. there's some kind of subliminal message in that too. Yeah, yeah. Gives it the... The, the positive energy that I wanted from it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Brilliant. Let's have a look at one of yours. Okay. Before we finish with a selection of other exhibited images, I just wanted to quickly say that Joe and I went on to discuss three other rather nice prints, but as this episode is already getting rather long, I'll save that footage for another day. Now, a couple of other quick things before I go. The Exhibition Tours and Talks on Saturday the 10th of September are now sold out. However, Joe and I will be there from 1pm on Sunday the 11th of September just to give a, a brief talk, answer your questions, sign books, etc. The gallery is open from 10am every day. So this is your last chance to experience the exhibition, perhaps buy a frame print or get hold of one of these A4 mounted prints. These are special editions numbered from 1 to 70 to help celebrate 70 years of the National Park. It's essentially one of every image that's in the Woodland Sanctuary book, so you'll have to be quick to get the one that you want. 
The exhibition book is available to order online and signed copies are available for patrons and in person at the exhibition next weekend. Now as the exhibition is almost over, I should hopefully be back out in the woods more often and the next episode should be from under the late summer woodland canopy. So until then, thank you very much for watching this episode and hope to see you again very soon.